for me in the age that I am and coming out of college and, and starting a family, we're starting to realize we don't know it all. Submitting to a shepherd gives you that resource and, and person to lean on and to, to cry on their shoulder and to, uh, and to turn to for guidance. Sometimes I think the weakness that I have is always falling back on me, always saying, okay, I've got to do something about this. And sometimes I don't even believe the solution is in the fixing. I think the solution is in the caring. I feel like we have a, lots and lots of people who are just dying and asking for and pleading for someone to take, come alongside them and, and shepherd them. I think what it means to, to be a shepherd investing in someone else's life is you find what their need is. Do you remember the first time that you gave someone a set of keys? Maybe it was to your house, maybe it was to your car. Uh, maybe it was to the office, but it was the first time that, that you had passed on this, this set of keys, and, it, and it's kind of like you cut them loose. It, it's, it's kind of like you said, okay, it's up to you now. Let's see what, what you can do. And, and do you remember the first time you got a set of keys? When you got the house key, the car key, and you were cut loose. And it's like, I can do, I can do anything. I can, I can conquer the whole world because I now have this key. I have what this key represents. Now, some of you don't have children, and, and some of you do. And I can remember one of the most significant times that I handed keys off was when I handed keys off to my boys to drive. I mean, it was, it was one of those things, fortunately, you don't experience all the time and you don't have to deal with all the time, but it was in those, those moments that, that it still makes me a little nervous when I think about teaching them how to drive and giving them those keys and letting them go off by themselves for the first time. You know, when that happens, it's, it's really kind of a rite of passage. It, it really is moving from childhood to adolescence, from adolescence into adulthood, they start taking some responsibility. And, and the older you get, you realize that, that the beginning of the empty nest is not just when the last child leaves home. It's when the last child gets the car keys. Because when they get the car keys, they're gone. I mean, they're out, they're about, and you're kind of wondering, well, where are you? Check in with me. You didn't call. You didn't tell me what was happening with you. And and it's this shift in their, their life because they learn how to drive. This is kind of what's happening in the book of Mark. When Jesus begins to pass on the responsibilities and the roles of leadership onto those men and women that were following him, it's kind of like he hands over the keys to the disciples. If you have your Bible, turn over to the Gospel of Mark chapter 1, and, and you have to understand this whole concept of responsibility, this whole concept of, of handing over the keys, of, of making a shift. You have to go back to the very beginning of the Gospel of Mark, because in the first chapter of the Gospel of Mark, we find, we find Jesus beginning his ministry. And it says this right up front, it says, he began to preach, that when Jesus left the carpenter shop and went out and began to tell others about who he was and who God is, the scripture says this, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news. What is the good news? The time has come. It's now. I've got the keys. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Now, I don't know if anybody responded to his sermon. I don't know if, if when he said, you know, if you sense God tugging at your heart, the altar's open, and we invite you to come down and pray right now to receive Christ. I don't know if people said, oh, I've got this major change going on in my life. And, and I don't know so much that Jesus was calling for an altar response as much as he was making a declaration. 
That for centuries, for millennia, we've been praying that the kingdom of God would come. We've been praying that, that God would break into our lives. We've been praying that God, we would, we would experience you in newness and in life and in wholeness. And Jesus comes along and he says, I just need to tell you, it's here. It's here. It's broken in. The keys are right here. It's a new day. It's a shift. It's a new beginning. It's a new way of understanding God at work in your life and in the world. The kingdom of God is at hand. It's here. And Jesus, I don't think that, that he was trying to persuade people to repent, to, to make it a life change as much as he was declaring the reality that God was at work and God does what he says he's going to do. And God has working out his plan. He's been working out his plan from creation till now. And now it's come about. The Messiah. It's happening. And, and you need to know this. The kingdom is here because I am here. And over in verse 16, Jesus goes on and it says, As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon. And his brother, Andrew, and they were casting a net into the lake. They were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men at once. They didn't waste any time. At once, they left their nets and they followed him. Here's Simon and Andrew, and later we find out James and John and, and a host of others. They were fishermen. They were out fishing. They were casting their nets. Jesus walks along the seashore. He sees them casting their net. And, and isn't it interesting that Jesus doesn't say, hey, guys, repent and believe. Hey, guys, you need to give up your sin, and you need to, to trust in me. You need to repent, turn from your sin, and then follow me. He doesn't, he doesn't say that. Apparently, they've already heard that message. But he says to them, something so amazing, follow me. And I don't think, and just in my looking inside here, what the implication is, I don't think the disciples followed Jesus so their sins would be forgiven. I don't think the disciples followed Jesus that they could get eternal life. And Well, if we follow him, we'll get this eternal life. If we do what he says and, and go where he goes, then we'll experience it. I think they followed Jesus because of one reason. He called them. He said, follow me. Follow me. And what they did is they followed him not just the repentance, not just the, the promise of heaven, not just all the goodies and all the blessings that come along with it. They followed him. They left everything that they had. Hey, guys, follow me, and I will make you fishermen of people. And I, I think, why did he use this phrase, fishermen? Well, maybe it's a, a quaint metaphor for, for something else. Maybe he's, he's saying something deeper. Maybe because he... He wanted to communicate with them in a language they would understand. Something that, that made sense to them. Maybe, maybe he was just trying to speak some vernacular language. He was speaking a language they understood. But, but the truth is, 600 years before this, the scripture says in Jeremiah that Jeremiah prophet, prophesied that, that, that the people of God would be scattered that they would go into captivity, that they would just be spread all across the world. But then it goes on and he says that, that when God was ready to restore his people in Jeremiah 16, chapter 16, verse 16, it says this, that the Lord will send for many fishermen and they will catch them. That when God is ready to restore what he was doing, when, when God was ready to bring the kingdom together, that he was going to raise up fishermen to catch his people and bring them back. You see, to be a fisherman, to be a fisher of men, to be a fisher of people is not simply to be an evangelist. It's not simply just say, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out and win people to the Lord. I'm going to cast the net and drag them in. But it's to engage in what God is already doing in Christ. 
to engage in a, in a campaign that he's doing way belong, before we ever got here, from the beginning of time. You see, Jesus called the disciples and they followed him. And then in chapter 3, verse 13, turn over there, would you? Chapter 3, verse 13 of the Gospel of Mark. It says that Jesus went up on a mountainside. He went up on a mountainside and, and he called to him those he wanted and they came to him. So once again, he calls. The disciples hear him call and they respond. They come to him. And he appointed 12, designating them as apostles. These leaders, these, these ones that are sent. Apostles means the sent ones. So he appointed 12 as key leaders to be sent that they might, what, be with him. He wanted them with him, but also that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. You see, it wasn't just so they could repent and just so they could believe and that they could have heaven. Oh, that's wonderful. But he, he called them that they could be with him, that they would then in turn be sent out to preach what they had experienced and not only just tell people about it, but to bring about life change, to bring about release of the captive. I wonder what, what is Jesus trying to do here? He's saying, I want you to be with me, but I also want you to learn how to drive. I, I want you to follow me but I don't want you just to hang out at a distance. I, I want you to follow me so that, that when I'm not in your presence or I'm over on the side, you take off. You, you do what I've been doing. Jesus is literally saying, I want you to get behind the wheel and I'm going to get in the back seat. I want you to drive. When I took my sons to get their driver's license, I, I remember taking them down to Springdale, as many of you have done, and, and, and I got to ride along with them in the car, and the officer who was administering the test got to be in the passenger seat, and I sat in the back seat, and, and what I did with both my boys is I positioned myself in the back seat, just kind of scooted over in the middle where they could see me in the rearview mirror. You know, I, I couldn't say anything, I couldn't do anything, but I could position myself so if, if I needed to, I could use my head, you know, or I could make some, I could make some facial expressions like, you know, that they could, they could kind of respond to me. And, and so I, I couldn't say anything, but I could sure do something about it. I remember when we took Jacob to get his license and he, he passed his written test and it was time for the, the driving test. And so I got in the back seat and I scooted over a little bit where he could see me in the rearview mirror and I winked at him and he winked back at me. And we were driving and we were driving through a residential section there in, uh, in Springdale and we came up to an area over in the harbor area and there was a four-way stop. But from all indication, he wasn't going to stop. And so I began to kind of <clears throat> make a little noise. I scooted over to the middle, and I looked at him, and I, uh, you know, doing, mm, and, and he kept looking in the rearview mirror, going, what are you doing? And he went right through that stop sign. <laughs> Needless to say, that wasn't the last time he took the driving test. <laughs> you see, I was trying to coach him. I was trying to be there for him. I couldn't do it for him, but I was trying to look over his shoulder and give him a little bit of help. This is kind of what Jesus is doing here. He's going, you guys are in the driver's seat. I, I'm going to sit back here. And I'm just going to coach you a little bit. I'm going to use my facial expressions. And, and I can say a few things to you, but you got to pay attention to the road. Don't, don't just blow the sign because you're trying to figure out what I'm doing. You stay in this process. And here's Jesus in Mark chapter 3 and chapter 4. And he's, he's coaching his disciples. And he's going, you know, I'm... I'm working with you. I'm training you, and you're, you're following me, and you're listening to me, and, I, and I'm going to work with you so I can send you out, and you can preach, and you can teach, and you can cast out demons. I, I'm doing this not just so, so you'll say, oh, you're so wonderful, Jesus. I, oh, man, we just love being with you. No, I'm, I'm raising you up so you can go. It's like he's saying... I'm the one driving right now, but, 
but in a short time, I'm going to get out, and I'm going to go to the back seat, and I'm going to put you in the driver's seat, and I'm just going to, I'm going to be here, and I'm going to give you direction, and I'm going to kind of help you know kind of what's going on, but, but you're going to have to do this thing. You're going to have to make these decisions. You're going to have to make the hard calls. I'm not the one in control of the will. You are. But you have to listen to my voice. And I'll save you some grief. I'll keep you from blowing that stop sign. I'll, I'll, I'll keep you from having to go back and have the test all over again. Because that happens, doesn't it? You know, God says, do this, and we don't do it. And guess what? We get to go right back there. It's not like we get to forget that one and go on. No, we get to go right back there and learn that lesson again. And if we don't learn it, we go right back there and we face it again. And if we don't learn it, we go right back there and face it again. And we think, oh, life is just overwhelming to me. We'll learn the lesson and move on. Because he puts you in the driver's seat. He's trying to give you direction. And, and, and what happens, he, he, he goes on and he says right here, he says that, that I'm, I'm driving right now, but in a short time, I'm going to put you in the driver's seat. I'm going to sit in the back seat, and, and then we're going to make some eye contact, and I'm going to give you some direction, and I'm going to tell you some things that some other people are not going to understand. And I'm going to tell you some things that other people aren't even going to know are being said and being done, but you're going to know because I'm going to tell you these things, and, and that's what's happening in Mark chapter 6. We're moving on now in Mark chapter Chapter 6, verse 7, it says right here, calling his disciples to him, he sent them out two by two and gave them authority over the evil spirits. I mean, they had walked with him. They had seen him do it. They stood in the background. Then they're with him, and they're doing it with him, and he's kind of along with them, coaching them. Now, he's put them in the driver's seat, and he's stepped out on the curb, and he's standing at a distance saying, go for it. Let's see how well you learned it. Let's see what you did. Two by two, so they're not alone. They're not lone rangers in this thing. He sends them out. Why? So he can give them authority even over the evil spirits. And then in verses 12 and 13, it says they went out and they did three things. They went out and they preached that people should repent. So they did what he did at the very beginning. Repent and believe for the kingdom of God is here. He says, I'm going to send you out. You're going to preach that people should repent. Secondly, they drove out demons, many demons. And third, they anointed the sick people with oil and healed them. Do you see what's happening here? Do you, do you see what Jesus is doing? I mean, the, the implication is really clear. Jesus did not just come to save us. Jesus came to recruit us. Now, now think of that again. Say, you know, kind of say that in your own mind. Jesus didn't come only to save us. And we go, oh, salvation, that's the main thing. Jesus came that we may have life eternal for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Praise the Lord. But it doesn't stop there, Jesus is saying. That's just the entry point. He comes not only to save us but to recruit us. Come follow me. Why? So you can be fishers of people. So you can be part of what I'm doing in the kingdom. You see, the call to, to be fishermen, the call to be fishers of people is to engage with God in doing what he's been doing from the beginning. He's calling you to lead while you follow. Jesus didn't come to earth just to forgive us. And that's important. He wants to forgive us. Why? Because that restores our relationship with him. But it's not just enough to be forgiven. He wants to change us and use us. It's not enough to say, well, you're forgiven. It's okay. But what difference does that make? Do we do different? Do we live different? Are we acting different? He didn't come to earth just so that we could go to heaven. Jesus came to earth so he could bring heaven to us, and we could share heaven with one another. That we can bring heaven here and bring it about in the lives of people. Oh, not that it would be a perfect place, but that they would experience God in his fullness and in his work. That he recruits us to come alongside him and he even recruits us to be sent out 
in this amazing mission to be more than leaders. He calls us to be shepherds. He calls us to be, to be shepherds. And, and, and you think, well, Pastor, that doesn't make any sense because the Scripture says that we are to be sheep. Right, We're, And this is a metaphor that really made a lot of sense back in the Bible times. Uh, sheep and, and goats were livelihood. I mean, that was a major industry. And, and so the early church understood it. Today, we don't fully get this sheep shepherd thing. Unless you raise sheep for 4-H or you know, 4-F and, and you show them or something like that. Paula did that when she was a kid. And some of you did that. And you understand a little bit more. But there's really no better word to describe what Jesus is calling us to than shepherd. Sheep. We are to follow. We are to be like sheep. I mean, the scripture says right here, Isaiah 53, 6, we all like sheep have gone astray. We've been like sheep. We've gone away from him. Or Psalm 100 says, know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Or I love John Chapter 10, verse 27, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. They follow me, Jesus says, because I'm the shepherd. I'm the good shepherd, and God is our shepherd. Psalm 23, we know that the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Ezekiel 34, God says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock, When he is with them, so I will look after my sheep. And Jesus calls himself the good shepherd. John 10 says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. In verse 14, he goes on to say, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep knows me. What he's saying is he, is he, he calls us to be in relationship with him, to follow him, but he also protects us and guides us and provides for us. We are his sheep. He is our shepherd. So following God is like a sheep following a shepherd, but, but it's more than just this coming along and, and following along, but he calls us to even something greater, to come along and be a shepherd alongside him. He calls us not only to be sheep, he calls us to understand his role as our shepherd. And then he calls us to shepherd like Jesus, to be like him and caring for others and ministering to others and giving our life and, and to go to those places. Now, I'm not, he's not talking about being a full-time pastor or a full-time missionary to quit your job and to move overseas. He may, but probably not. Who knows? But he's calling you to take what he's doing in you to the places wherever you go. If it's your workplace or your school or your classroom or the locker room or on the sports team, in your circle of friends when you go out to eat, in in your chats or on Facebook or, or wherever you are, you take him there. You show him there. And what it means is, is being a shepherd is not just simply following along with Jesus it's, and going for the ride. Rather, being a shepherd, being a disciple is doing what he calls you and I to do. That, that he calls us to follow. He calls us and then he sends us out. We do what he calls us to do and then we make sure it parallels what God is doing. That he doesn't call us just to do our own thing. Or you take that group of sheep and you go off in that direction and you take. He says, no, I want it to parallel with what I'm doing. To be in the middle of, of what I'm about. That's what it means to be a disciple. That's what this journey of discipleship this, this, that every Christian is called to. Not only to be a sheep to follow. Not only to understand God is our shepherd. But to also realize that God calls us to step into that role of leadership and shepherd for those people that he's put under our care. So how does God help us make that shift? How do we change from just being sheep, so we're followers and yeah, whatever you say, or, if, or we're like the, the sheep of Isaiah that each of us are like sheep, you know, we go our own way, that we actually do follow him. Well, Mark chapter 6, verse 12 and 13 
gives us a clue of how to do it. He says this, then they went out and they preached that people should repent. And they drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. And what I believe, and I know this is going to be crazy to you, I believe what Jesus called those first century disciples to do is the same thing he calls you and me to do in this 21st century. He calls you and me to do the very same thing, what? To preach. Oh, he's not talking about going to seminary necessarily. He's not talking about putting together a sermon and standing up in front of people and preaching it. But he's, he's talking about sharing your story and sharing what God has done in your life wherever you are with whoever you are with. If it's on a bus or in a class or in a lobby or a cafeteria or a, a car driving somewhere, that, that you bring up Jesus, that Jesus is part of the conversation. One of the tricks and the deceitful maneuvers of Satan is to not disprove God, not to, to disrespect God, it's to ignore God. To get us into situations and place that we're told it's not appropriate to talk about your faith. It's not appropriate to share what's most important with you. And I'm not talking about going out and trying to evangelize and hold up signs or anything like that. But I'm talking about sharing your story of what's your, what are your values. And you know, you can share your faith in a, a variety of different ways. But what is going on with you where you become real with people? That you speak into people's lives what God is doing in your life. You bring Jesus into conversations to preach. Second thing he says is that you need to heal. That you need to heal people and deliver people from sickness. And even if you cannot take somebody's fever away, even though God may not give you the gift of healing, that, that you would pray in a specific situation, that person would be physically healed. You love them and you listen to them. And you bring healing to their hearts and to their soul, to their inner parts. I think that's why Jesus loved to touch people. When the leper would come to him, somebody who had not been touched in years, Jesus touched them. Why? Because his presence brings healing and wholeness. And you are his representatives. You are to move from just being a sheep to being a shepherd alongside him. That when when he calls you not just to speak his name and to bring him into conversations, but also to speak grace and to healing and to show by your presence that God is there. You know, being a pastor sometimes is, is a very challenging time when you're with people in a hospital room or you're next to a deathbed. And you know that unless God intervened and it was a miraculous touch of God, there's nothing you can do. And you find yourself at a place where you really don't have anything to say. What can I say? And at those times, I've just had to say to the Lord, I've said, Lord, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. All I can do is just be your presence here. And I have to tell you, that's enough. You don't have to have all of the platitudes and all of the, the wisdom and all of the, the things that you say that make people, oh, wow, you're so smart and you're so holy. You're just there representing Christ. You're bringing Jesus into the situation. And you're letting people know that God haven't, hasn't forgotten them. That yes, you may be ill, and yes, you may be experiencing this cancer, you may be having this disease, or you may have this brokenness, but I need to tell you that God is still at work and God loves you, because this isn't the final story. God is still working. And one of the hardest things for you and for me is to realize that death is part of life. I mean, it is. Even Lazarus who Jesus raised from the dead, there came a time when he died again. Two people, there are only two people recorded in the Bible that that are not recorded to ever dying. Enoch and Elijah. And at the end of time, it's, it's understood that those will be the two witnesses that come back who will be in Jerusalem and proclaim the good news of Christ. And many Jews will turn to Jesus because of their witness. Why? Because they had not tasted death. But what will they experience? They will experience martyrdom, according to Revelation. 
they will be killed. Death is our enemy. But Jesus has overcome even death, the sting of death. And one of the issues of healing that Jesus wants you and I to realize that that healing is not just about, oh, now I'm well, I don't have that fever, I don't have that disease anymore. Healing is also of the heart, the brokenness and the pain and the, the disease of the soul. To speak grace, to love people, to physically touch, to say, I, I'm here with you, I'm representing Christ. Heal the sick. You bring God's presence. Third thing I believe that Jesus calls us to do, not only to preach and to heal, but also to deliver. And today we see all kinds of programs on television about ghosts and demonic activity, and and it's been glorified with zombies and other different types of things. We go, oh, that's so cool, and yet... And yet it's, it's, it's um, marginalized and minimalized that, that the, the world is not the same today as it was before Jesus was here. Jesus defeated the demonic upon the cross. And so the power of the demonic does not operate the same today as it did before Jesus was crucified and rose from the dead. And yet the demonic still is at work in lives of people. Through alcohol, through, through gambling, through sexual addictions, through emotional distress through just the, the, the weights and the cares of the world. And, and Jesus calls you and me to come and to deliver. And he's not talking about exorcism, and maybe at times there is. When you go to a third world nation, they'll practice exorcism in the church because demonic, the animism and the spiritism is so prevalent in those world areas. But here, it has to do with the heart and the mind and the emotion to bring deliverance to share the grace of God, to walk alongside them, that that God would work in them through healing and and hope in the midst of their hardness and their brokenness. You shepherd people by loving them in spite of their pain, in spite of their bondage without judgment. I had somebody ask me, well, you know, Pastor, where do we stand on homosexuality? Well, the scripture's real clear on where we stand. Well, well, how would you feel if somebody who practiced that came to church? And I said, I think that would be absolutely wonderful. Well, what do you mean? I said, well, what a wonderful opportunity to share God's grace with them. Because I believe our people would love anybody in any situation if they're living deep in sin or the best saint in the world because you can't minister to somebody that can't ever hear the gospel. Would we agree with their lifestyle? No. Would we, would we condone it? No. Would we love and accept them? Yes. Doesn't matter what the sin is. Would we allow them in the leadership? No. Would we allow them to teach our kids? No. Well, then you don't really accept them. Oh, but we do. You've missed the whole point of what acceptance is. You've missed the whole point of what tolerance is. See, we're fed this line to be tolerant is to allow anybody else to do what they want, but you can't say anything about it. To be tolerant is to love them in spite of it, but to be true to God's calling for our lives. To stand up for what is true. And we're fed so many lines, and and we're pushed down in so many different ways, but we're called to preach and to heal and to deliver. To help people disentangle the spiritual darkness of their lives through the power of the Holy Spirit. He see, calls us to move from sheep to shepherd. And, and what's so amazing here is the disciples are preaching and they're, they're healing and they're delivering. And it's amazing what's going on because they, they come back and, and they're delivering people. I mean, it, it's, it's spectacular. In Mark chapter 6, verse 30, the apostles gathered around Jesus, Mark says, and they reported to him all that they had done and taught. And this is so cool. They report to Jesus, this is what's happening. And, and Jesus is asking a question, well, who did you, who'd you talk to? Who'd you heal? Who'd you, what, what happened in their life? And Jesus is just getting all pumped up and excited. And the disciples are all excited because they are part of what God is doing, part of his campaign, part of, of his work in the world. And, and Jesus had shown them how. Now they had gone out and had done it. And when I, when I read that, I think, wow, 
How wonderful it must have been to have a conversation with Jesus like that. Alan, how's your week been? Oh, it's, it's, it's been pretty good. Well, who have you ministered to? Who have you talked to? Who have you prayed with? What, what, how's God working in their life? What difference is it making in their life? What's going on in them? And, 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 and who shared their burdens with you? And how are they finding help and deliverance? And Man, it would be so cool. It would be also challenging, wouldn't it? You didn't talk to that person? You didn't offer grace? Come on, you can do better than that. Here, let me help you with that. And I can imagine the conversation that, that Jesus is having with his disciples. And, and, and they're having this conversation in verse 31. It goes on and says this in chapter 6. Because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourself to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. And then the scripture says this, it goes on, verse 35, and when Jesus landed and he saw the crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Listen to that for a moment. He saw the people. There's so many needs. The disciples were exhausted. They needed to rest. But Jesus, he doesn't take a break. He saw them. He had compassion on them. They were a sheep without a shepherd. And so he began to teach them many things. And, and by this time of day, it was late. So the disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said. And it's already very late. Send them away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. The disciples are going, this is crazy, Jesus. We're tired. We're hungry. We've been, we've been putting out all week. And, and, you know, we need a break here. And, 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 you know, these people, they ought to be able to take care of themselves. I mean, why are we the ones that have to step up and help all the time? You know what I mean? I mean, they're adults. They can do this. They've got their own families. They've got their own resources. Jesus, send them away. Send them away so they can get something to eat. But Jesus answered them. You give them something to eat. You. And, and you know, there's going to come a time in your life where God, wherever God has placed you, that you're not going to be able to get away from it. That he's going to come to you and he's going, he's going to say to you, it's time to step up. It's time for you to get out of the passenger seat and get in the driver's seat. It's time for you to be the shepherd. It's time for you to give them something to eat. It may not be today. It may not be tomorrow. It may not be for weeks or, or months. You may go to work tomorrow, and, and you're going to be around people who are just distracted. Their eyes are dark, their heart's dark. Their home is struggling, their relationships are falling apart, and it looks like there's no way. Their finances are in shambles, and they're up to debt. It's just it's, it's destroying them. And you're going to have a voice come to you and say, it's time to step up. Oh, no, 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 no. Not me, Lord. I can't do that here. I can't say that here. I haven't earned the right to say that. And Jesus is going to go, it's not about you. It's always about you, isn't it? It's not about you. You give them something to eat. You say what I'm telling you to say. And you find people that feel like they're imposters and, and they're just going through the motions and, and, and they're just shallow because of their past. And, and, and we get past the good mornings and the hi, how are you? And you hear this voice come and say, time to say something. Time to step up. Time to come to a place where you offer grace. Maybe you need to preach. Maybe you need to heal. Maybe you need to deliver. Oh, Lord, I don't, I don't know about this. But if you're a disciple of Christ, Jesus looks straight at your, the eyes of your heart and says, you're on. It's your responsibility. 
It's not just somebody else. It's not just waiting for, oh, God, I pray somebody would come along and share the gospel with them. You're on. Step up. Well, I can't do this, Lord. It takes, it, there's too many people here. I have so few resources, and, 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 and it takes connections, and I don't have very many connections. And, and then the voice comes to you and says, you, you give them something to eat. See, isn't it amazing in this story that you read over in Luke and, and John that, that, that Andrew comes to Jesus at this time and he brings this little boy, this little boy that everybody discounts and writes off. And this boy has a sack lunch with him and it's just a few loaves and a couple of fish. And, and, G, and I, I wonder if Andrew's saying to Jesus, Jesus, this is really absurd, okay? I want to show you how absurd it is. Look what we have. It's all we have. And Jesus is going, that's all we need. And he takes that and he multiplies it and he hands it out. And the scripture says that all the people were fed up to 5,000 men, which says that there were women and children there as well. But God, out of just a very little bit, we say, well, God, I don't have enough. I, I just don't know what to say. It's okay. Follow me and I'll provide. Because he can make things out of nothing. He, you know, he, he, he brings about life. He speaks life into the world in which we live. And what a beautiful ending to the story in verse 42. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. Can you imagine? I mean, here are these disciples. They're going, we don't have enough. Now they're telling Jesus, we got too much. We got too much. I like what one commentator said. He said that, uh, that there were 12 baskets full of food left over only indicates that there were still people that needed to be fed. You know, a couple weeks ago, we asked you to fill out a card. Uh, many of you did, a gift card. Nine of you wrote out needs, and 18 of you wrote out a gift that you have to offer. Uh, this week, we were able to, to meet one of those needs. Somebody said, I needed a new tire, and... Somebody said, I'd give some money, and so we got them together, and they got a new tire. Uh, somebody said, I needed a new job, and somebody else said, we can do that, so we, they got a new job. And there are other needs. To say, here's where I am, here's this, the need I have, and then for us to be able to say, here's how I can help. I've got this to offer. I don't know who to offer it to, but I'm, God, here's my, my, my little sack, just a few loaves and just a few fish, and to be honest with you, when I finish eating it, I'm still going to be hungry. And Jesus says, that's okay. Give it to me. And let me multiply that. You see, disciples still gather today. We still meet with the same Messiah. We still feed others with the same bread. And you may think that, oh, I'm, I'm not a leader. I, I can pass on this one. You know, I, this, is, this is not for me, but... That's the point. We're called not to only be sheep, we're called to be shepherds. He's our great shepherd, but he also calls us to come alongside him. Or maybe, maybe you say, well, I'm, I'm already doing that kind of stuff and I really don't have anything to learn here. But all of a sudden, when Jesus comes along and you say, God, I want to be a shepherd unto you, he gives you a whole different value system. And that's what this sixth soul shift is all about. Sheep to shepherd. That I take on responsibility for somebody else, for their spiritual well-being. Am I, am I taking over their life? No, but I'm taking responsibility to encourage and bless and, and be a part of their life. I'm, I'm, I'm being concerned maybe for the very first time in somebody else's Spiritual growth, the climate of the place where I work, the, the, the lives of the people that I'm in contact with. Maybe you're the only Jesus that people will come into contact with. Or maybe you're one of the Jesuses that people will come into contact with that will guide them in the right way. And being a shepherd is not about using people. It's about empowering people. It's not about... You saying, well, but these are my dreams and my hopes, but it's, and, and, and it's not about you doing away with those, but it's 
It's not making that the center stage, but all of a sudden you can encourage people in their hopes and their dreams and actually dream for them. That somewhere in God's plan to save the world, he includes you and me. To move from sheep to shepherd, to preach, to heal, to deliver. You see, God measures our life not just by how big our plans are, not just by what we think we can accomplish or how many people follow us, but he measures our life by how we're following him and leading others to him, being used by him. And I think that's what Jesus said. He says, let your light so shine before men that they would see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. You see, in Jesus' view of leadership, it's to move from sheep to shepherd. That's the measure of a transformed life. Father, we are challenged by your words today. We're spoken to your disciples. That's us. Your followers. That's us. To people who've repented of their sins and, 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 and given them their lives over to your lordship and in obedience and in a surrender. That's us. And, and we recognize that it's not just about we need to be sheep. We need to follow. But there comes a time and a calling in every single disciple's life when you say, okay, now it's time to drive. With your heads bowed and eyes cloud closed, would you just think about a couple questions? Who is it that's shepherding you? What have they been teaching you? How have they been encouraging you? What are they, what are they been guiding you in? Next question is this: Who are you shepherding? Are you just staying at a safe distance? Well, Jesus is my Savior. When Jesus says, I want you to come up with me. I want you to watch me and I want you to do it alongside me. And then Jesus wants to say, now I want to send you out. To move from sheep to being a shepherd like Jesus. You're not Jesus. We know that. I'm not Jesus. But he empowers us to be his image and reflection and presence in our worlds. And when Jesus speaks to you by his Holy Spirit, are you just going to make another excuse or are you going to say, yes, Lord? I'll go. I, I don't have much. All I've got is this little bag. And Jesus says, that's enough. Just use what you've got and let me multiply it. And then we see the miraculous that there's so much left over that we're able to even share with others. Father, we want to be your disciples. We want to be your followers. We want to be shepherds in your kingdom. We want to make the shift in our lives that, that we're transformed from just sitting on the back pew and sitting, just going along for the ride to being a part of what you're doing. And we want to do that not just because of our desire, but because you have called us. Follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. And we know by faith that you've called every single one of us to be your presence and your agent and your messengers of, of grace and peace and holiness where we live and where we work and where we move. Help us to be obedient to you. To not only follow you, but to step out that others can follow us like a good shepherd who leads his or her sheep. So what is the Lord saying to you today? If you don't know the shepherd, you can. 
You can cry out to him right now and say, Lord Jesus, come into my life and forgive me of my sins and be my Lord and I want to follow you. And he will. But if you are his sheep, he's calling you now to come closer, to step up, to make the shift, to be part of his plan and his work in this world. Father, we surrender our lives to you in obedience and in thankfulness. And we give you praise and honor and glory. Glorify yourself in us and through us as individuals and as your people, as your church in the world. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Would you stand with me? And now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead, the Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep. By the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to him be glory and honor forever and ever. May God bless you and give you grace. I invite you to come back tonight to our service. Pastor Kathy will be preaching. And I'm looking forward to that. God give you his presence.